broadcasting. Blog Talk USA. Are you tired of waiting for change? One zero one two. That gives me one thousand two hundred and fifty feet. Texas. Announce the arrival of the flight from Los Angeles and Chicago. That that was very loud, uh, and I apologize for that. Uh, that. That shouldn't have happened, but it did. And listen, being the professionals that uh, Richard Zombeck and I are, uh, not only will I be eating a Reese's peanut butter cup at some point during the show, I'm going to let that go. Um, welcome to this Monday, uh, the March 28th edition of TNZ Talk. Uh, A happy belated Easter for those of you that celebrated, as I did uh, yesterday. Hope you had a nice weekend. Um, It's all about the Trump hump at this point. Uh, Donald Trump continues to make news. Uh, Every time we turn around, it's about what did Donald Trump say this time. The insanity, of course, is no matter what he says, uh, those loyal to him continued to stay loyal. Joining me now, as he will for the next hour, is the co-host of TNZ Talk, the Z in TNZ, the Richard Z. Zombeck, a writer for uh, the Huffington Post and Liberals Unite. Z, a pleasure to have you. Hope you had a nice Easter Sunday. Um, yeah, it was. Um, it was non-eventful. Quiet. 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 And actually, okay. uh, we, um, my wife and I, uh, I, I have scarcity issues. So if, if we get down to like uh, six rolls of toilet paper in the house, I have to go get more toilet paper. So. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's pretty much like Please everything. Please tell me that's you know? not it's, what you did yesterday. Like, like if there's a, if there's a quarter, a quarter left in the m- milk, uh, or orange juice, or there's two apples left, um, I, I have to I have to go restock the house. It's just it's it's a thing I have. I have scarcity issues. Is, and, is uh, that what you did yesterday? Nothing was open. Really? And and we didn't bother calling to find out. I think we actually looked up on the internet to see if Costco was open because you know we get it in bulk. We get three hundred rolls of toilet paper because that's the smallest uh, package they have. And then uh, a little bit of an exaggeration, of course. Right. It's more like 250 rolls of toilet paper. Oh, stop it. <laughs> but, uh, and, and a giant vat of mayonnaise. And um, All right. I have, to, I have to ask the obvious question. If you're going through 250 rolls of toilet paper and there are only two of you in the house, how much are you or how often are you actually taking a dump? Well, that's mostly me because I'm full of it. Right. I mean, I, I okay. can't. Okay. I've certainly been told that a lot. My dad used to tell me your eyes are brown because you're full of it up to here. Full of right, he, yeah. You know, what a so, clever fellow. He had a lot of good ones. Actually, I put one of his um, one of his quotes uh, in two of my articles on HuffPost. The most recent one was on Friday about the um, the benefits of uh, podcasting from a blogger's perspective. Um, when I got my FCC license when I was a kid, he said he he told he gave me that old Groucho Marx line of, "You definitely have a face for radio." Um, <laughs> so he doesn't well, remember saying anyway. that though. Well, that's all right. He's getting older. We can forgive that. At this Give point. him a little slack. Um, before we get into Donald Trump, and we've got plenty. We obviously. I need to talk about a spectacular weekend for one Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders. Yes, we do. And his the feel the the Bernie bird. Yeah. Tell that story because it's awfully good. I I am, of course, referring to uh, uh, Bernie's event in uh, Portland, Oregon, where he's going on about college uh, college uh, financing and and paying for college and and all that and this the crowd notices off to his right off camera and on the ground is this this little bird and everyone's screaming and screaming and screaming and then Bernie Sanders goes what what what's going on 
and they point it out to him and he looks and the bird flies up onto his podium and just sits there and looks at him for a little while. And the face that Bernie Sanders has and the, and the reaction that he has is absolutely priceless. And let me I, – I know you and I are – are in uh, mortal combat over Bernie and, and Hillary. But I will say this one thing. For a, a little bird to land within a foot of you and just sit there and look at you, you got to have a pretty good soul. So that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> okay. And I'm not going to disagree with you. Listen, the, the division we have between Bernie and Hillary is I'm more even-handed than you are. That's it. Yeah, you that's, are, prob- that's you probably are- true. That's it. I I love Bernie Sanders. I have no problem if he ends up being the nominee. Um, I would support him with everything I have. That applies to Hillary Clinton as well. Um, Do I have a preference? What did I say on Ed Schultz's show uh, the day of the Michigan primary? Who did I vote for? Yeah, no, I know. I know. Who did I vote for? Say it out loud. Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders. Thank you. Bernie Sanders. I'm I do, just I do on want to the mention, program. I'm just on the program a little more even-handed about it than you are on social media, because I follow you, Richard Zombeck. You rarely post anything positive about Hillary. In fact, I would suggest you never post anything positive about Hillary Clinton. You love to bash the DNC, and you are unabashedly, unapologetically in Bernie Sanders' corner. Am I? painting that wrong i don't think so uh no you're you're not i I do want to mention i do want to mention uh i do want to mention a couple messages uh from god uh so there's this uh facebook page um and the the Mm -hmm. guy is is god it's uh facebook.com slash the good lord above if anyone wants to follow him he's got uh he, uh, he's very LGBT uh, rights. In fact, uh, he did a fundraiser a few months back to put a billboard up outside the Westboro Baptist Church, a huge huh. billboard. He he got the funds, and there's a the cartoon picture of him with God Loves Gays uh, on this huge billboard, and he did a Kickstarter, raised the funds for it, and put this billboard up outside the Westboro Baptist Church. And the other day on Facebook, he said, hey, Bernie Sanders, did you get the tweet I sent you? And I just thought that was was really, really well done and very, uh, just very clever. The guy is, he's he's excellent. And he gets trolled by um, these hyper-religious Bible thumping morons that tell him he's going to hell and all that, and he tur- he he's, he actually has a, a really good understanding of the Bible because he manages to turn everything around on them. And um, well, you know, as far as I'm concerned, because as you pointed out, I'm biased. Uh, he wins every argument. <laughs> well, he is God after all, and by the way, exactly. God doesn't go to hell. Exactly. Uh, just want to just want to point that out. Uh, Bernie was on the Sunday morning talk shows yesterday, that would be Bernie Sanders, and says that they have momentum. Um, And listen, this isn't a caveat. It's just a question. Most of the states he have won, well, he has won, have been caucus states. And there was a, uh, and I don't remember, maybe it was the Washington Post. uh, I don't think it was the New York Times uh, that said the reason that he's winning the caucus states is that more young people caucus than do primaries. Uh, and I think you can make a case for that. I, I, I don't you know, necessarily uh, disagree with that. But when we take a look at that fact that uh, he's winning mostly caucus states, except he's won all caucus states except for two. Um, what do we, can, you, can we attribute that to the younger voters? I think we can at some level. And the question is, if he is not the nominee, uh, will they coalesce around Hillary or will she need Bernie to push them in her direction? I'm sorry, did I lose you? Um, you, you didn't. I just uh, I had my my mic muted, something that I always oh, get okay. on your I always get on your case about. 
Um, <laughs> okay. So as it as it turns out, Tony, uh, I'm not I'm not perfect. I just I lost my my ranking. Um, so to answer to answer I think, your question, I think no less of you, by the way. <laughs> which is which is more than I can say for what I think. Sometimes I'm kidding. So to answer to answer your question, uh, I uh, I'm having a hard time with this because. What I'm seeing a lot of, which I'm not really happy about, is uh, the possibility that people will possibly not vote if Bernie's not the nominee. And I think he's going to have to really kind of do a call to arms uh, if and when he isn't the nominee in order to to get Hillary, you know, in order to get a Democrat elected. Otherwise, um, hey, we could have... uh, Lion Ted or Sleazy Donald? Yeah, well, you know, listen, I think that his full-throated endorsement of Hillary Clinton is going to be critical uh, to her winning the presidency if she indeed is the nominee. And, you know, that's something that you and I will watch very, very closely. Uh, But as Bernie made the rounds this weekend, he talked about things like the George Clooney barbecue that cost $353,000 a couple to attend. That, of course, is a fundraiser for Hillary Clinton. He um, talked about having momentum. He talked about changing the minds of superdelegates. He talked about a lot of things, and I'm not so sure they're outside the realm of reality. I think that he does have some momentum. Unfortunately, as we look at the uh, next couple of primaries, um, he's not doing terribly well in the polling, uh, but that was true for Michigan, and he overcame that handily enough. Uh, It doesn't look like he can win New York State. Uh, Wisconsin is way up in the air. Pennsylvania is not close at this point. And I just don't get it. I mean, I do believe he has no momentum. I do believe that he has proven that he's electable. So I don't understand what's going on in these primary states. That's why I asked the question. I really don't understand it, Z. I, I, I don't have an answer to it. Well, and he also, in, in some polls, as we've discussed, he, he beats both uh, Trump and Cruz by pretty solid numbers. And in some cases, more than, than Hillary would, uh, would beat them. Uh, you know, so going back to your original question, there's an article that someone posted on on my Facebook page uh, from the Huffington Post that's titled Hillary's supporters really sweating over Bernie or bust. And these are not millennials responding to this. They're they're actually they're probably about five years younger than me. So it puts them, you know, late 40s. They're about my brother's age, so probably 50 and this is what one of them writes. Don't blame me if Hillary can't be the, beat the worst crop of GOP contenders in my lifetime. Blame the Democratic National Committee for coronating Hillary before the first votes were cast and sandbagging any sort of debate coverage. Blame the Democratic Party for nominating a neoconservative poll-watching war hawk bought and paid for by Goldman Sachs. And the, the, the other comments under it, which are all around the same age of, of people, says about the same thing. Um, you know, every day I become more and more, not by Bernie Sanders himself, but by his candidacy's exposure of the absolutely bankrupt democratic politics of triangulation. So, you know, uh, this is, this is what we're, we're dealing with and this is how people feel. And, and I feel a lot the same way, Tony. I feel that, that her, her, her nomination is more of a coronation. I feel that the, the media has already, uh, nominated her, um, as have the delegates and superdelegates. And, you know, there was a huge outrage over uh, a, a Washington uh, state rep who gave his delegate vote to um, Hillary Clinton, despite Bernie Sanders taking the state by what, 76 uh, percent? So, you know, I understand how delegates work and that they vote their conscience and they do what's best for the country, blah, 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 blah. But the perception, much like the RNC, uh, that people are having is not um, – it may not be accurate to how things work, but 
people are finally starting to pay attention and they're not liking what they see. Well, you know, you're, and you're right. Perception is reality. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, rules that have been in effect since 1984 are coming as a surprise to people. You actually just said the key thing there and that people are finally starting to pay attention. And that's all well and good. And I would think that the DNC Rules Committee is going to have to rethink superdelegates uh, after this election. Unlike the Republican convention where they can change the rules before the convention, the Democrats don't work that way. And so uh, it's just not going to happen in this cycle. Uh, I don't know that, uh, like I do know that Hillary Clinton was coronated uh, before anybody else got in the race. And I know they started raising money for her. Um, I started getting emails in 2013 from a pro-Hillary pack uh, asking me to donate. Um, by the way, I've been very generous to both candidates, uh, giving them both $5. Oh, good for you. Yeah. Um, good. good for you. you know, and, and because of that, I get uh, multiple emails from both campaigns every day asking me to contribute a dollar. That's that's awesome. And if I did it every day, yeah, if I did it every day, of course, that would be <laughs> three hundred and you know sixty five dollars a year. Um, I, you know, it gets a little old. It does. Uh, and I, I love the way both candidates spin what's going on. And, and Hillary after the weekend was, hey, listen, we told you if you didn't donate, this would happen. Well, guess what? It happened. Bernie's campaign is, we told you if you gave us a dollar, this would happen, and it happened. Okay, guys, let's try something a little more fresh and original, but I'll, I'll let that go for now. I get really tired of the fundraising emails. I don't know if you get them, Z, but I, I get it. I, I mean, I literally, I subscribe to everybody's email list, uh, Trump, uh, Cruz, Kasich. Now, oh. I've unsubscribed to those that... that uh, that dropped out. But on top of that, of course, Clinton and Sanders, and they all send out multiple upon multiple emails uh, every day with the exception of the Trump campaign. Interestingly, as I was doing some reading uh, both uh, Friday evening and Saturday evening, and I posted uh, this story uh, on social media, the Republican National Committee has done a little fundraising letter where they send out a bill on the envelope, on the face of the envelope, it says, pass due, pay immediately. When you open it up, it is a letter uh, to uh, just join the Republican National Committee. But to look at the envelope, and if you don't read the small print, you don't know it's a fundraising letter. You think right. that your membership is up and they want you to send $25. How many people right. do you think are doing that? A lot. Well, and uh, I, I think uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign actually got into some trouble, um, at least in the news over the weekend, for, for doing that and hitting, um, basically hitting up uh, the, the elderly on that. Uh, with that no, kind I of, didn't, I didn't see that. I mean, the that, RNC definitely did that. I don't remember seeing Hillary's campaign being charged with that. Yeah, I'll have to. I'll have to. Look I just it up. didn't see it. Yeah, look it up and send it to me because uh, Cruz's campaign has done that. The RNC has done it, but I have not seen that Hillary's campaign has. I'm not saying that it hasn't. I'm just saying that I'm not familiar with it. Yeah, and, um, and, I, and I could right. and I we, could be wrong, but it's also I mean, on on uh, you know, Cru Cruz Cruz has been a real sleaze bag. I mean, when it comes to this kind of stuff, he's been really well. He uh, really is lying, Ted. I mean, the, you know, Donald Trump's not wrong there. He really is lying, Ted. Well, and what what I found funny is that you know he he comes out all mad because of this argument over their wives. And the best that uh, that Cruz can come up with is he's going to have a new nickname and it's going to be Sleazy Donald. And and you're just like, what are you, five? I mean, really? That that wasn't even good. I mean, you know, couldn't you? Well, you know, and I, I wrote this morning in a, in a post on social media that Ted Cruz sounds practiced and rehearsed. 
Uh, he sounds like uh, what Marco Rubio was sounding like when he was Robotic Rubio. Uh, it's almost as if they uh, focus group tested uh, Ted Cruz's one-liners, and they're supposed to be zingers, and they don't zing. And, and, you know, is this my wife is off limits, Uh, you know, and and we go on and on and on. He sounds practiced and rehearsed, and he's another one that's not good at that. He should stick to impromptu because he's better at that than he is at these rehearsed lines. I could be wrong. I could be 100 percent wrong. No, I don't. I don't think you're I don't think you're wrong at all. He he comes off as just, you know, just kind of a moron. Um, and, and, And like you said, rehearsed. And not very well rehearsed either. I mean, it just, they're, they're lousy lines. I mean, I could come up with better stuff than that in, you know, the span of two minutes. Just talking to you, I could come up with better stuff like that, you know? And you do. <laughs> uh, and, and you do. Well, listen, we, we have a, a nice selection of audio today and i'm gonna let you go ahead and spin the wheel because there's some really good stuff here but before we do that i want to point out that between the washington post editorial board a disaster kerfuffle for donald trump and his sit down with the new york times and other media outlets over the last three days to talk foreign policy he has yet to answer a question honestly and he doesn't have a plan for anything, although he refuses to rule out war with China. He's talked about <laughs> not beautiful. buying oil from Saudi Arabia. And I could go on and on and on. He has yet to answer a question honestly. And during the Washington Post interview, when asked a serious question on foreign policy, his response was, you know, you're all beautiful people. Could you all identify yourself? Yeah. They did, and then he didn't answer the question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's uh, Ugh. it's 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 really kind of kind of really creepy. Uh, and um, you know, do, do you do you want me to um, so uh, Eugene Robinson uh wrote an article that was up this morning, uh in Washington post. And you want me to read a quick, uh, a, a quick paragraph from, from, uh, sure. I, okay. Yeah. I read it. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Yeah. And actually the quote, the quote from Trump is, is awesome. And I'm going to try to get through it without choking or laughing. But so the, the paragraph before is, By the way, uh, while you're doing that, while you're doing that, take your time. Cause I'm going to eat my little Reese's peanut butter cup. Oh, beautiful. Okay. So, uh, That's Trump, what you hear me opening here. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe you want to mute your microphone while while you do that. Well, I will. But I just you and I have had some. You, know, you and I have had some conversations about audio, Tony. And no, you know, not, frankly, no problem. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I got. I got to mute my. I got to mute my microphone. Go ahead. <laughs> so, Robinson writes. Trump's response was to give an empty soliloquy, ending with the declaration that I am a very strong believer in law enforcement, but I'm also a very strong believer that inner cities can come back. Asked twice more whether blacks and whites receive disparate treatment, Trump offered this. The remainder of this is a quote from Donald Trump, by the way. These are these are my notes. So here's Donald Trump's response to whether or not black blacks and whites receive disparate treatment. I've read where there are, and I've read where there aren't. I mean, I've read both. And, you know, I have no opinion on that. Because, frankly, what I'm saying is, you know, we have to create incentives for people to go back and to reinvigorate the areas to put people to work. And, you know, we have lost millions and millions of jobs to China and other countries. And they've been taken out of this country. And when I say millions, you know, it's it's tremendous. I've seen five million jobs. I've seen numbers that range from six million to to smaller numbers. But it's many millions of jobs. And it's to countries all over. Mexico is really becoming the new China. And I have great issue with that. That that was that was Donald Trump's. No, no opinion. China, Mexico. Really? I mean, this is, oh, yeah. Well, let's go, back to the, let's go back to the basic question. Is there a disparate difference between the way blacks and whites are treated by the police? Now, there was a great story in the Washington Post on Saturday morning that was titled, Why 
poor white kids are less likely to go to jail than rich black kids. Uh, it's well worth Googling. It's well worth reading. Saturday Morning Z, I took place, as you know, as a panelist uh, on a diversity summit. And we spent a lion's share of our time talking about racial profiling. Had Donald Trump had given that answer to this group of Pakistanis and Indians and Muslims and blacks, etc., he wouldn't have just been booed out of the room. They probably would have beat the living tar out of him. Because the reality is, there is racial profiling. You know, Ted Cruz is a big proponent of racial profiling, as we now know. Well, they both are. Donald Trump is a big proponent, I was just going to say that, of racial profiling, as we already know. So, Donald, go ahead and don't answer the question. And interestingly, um, Donald Trump is sitting down with Chris Matthews Wednesday night at 8 o'clock on MSNBC to do a town hall meeting. I hope this question comes up. I hope that he talks about the Washington Post editorial board interview and the New York Times editorial board interview, the circus at, you know, in, um, foreign policy interview, and others. <clears throat> the man is an absolute freaking disaster and has no plan and cannot articulate anything on foreign policy that makes any sense, except we know that he's for everything that the Geneva Conventions are against. Well, and and he and the interesting thing too is as as a result of this this Washington board interview, which was what it was it an, an hour and something, an hour or, and three minutes. Okay, so yeah, so it was an hour hour long. The 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 reporters and editorial board in there talking to Donald Trump and most of them who have come out and written stories about this and other reporters who have seen the transcript and listened to the interview are absolutely astounded at the lack of knowledge and deflection in this interview. And what get we're I mean, when did this all start in June? Right. So we've got July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February. It's taken them eight months to realize that this guy's a complete moron. Andrea Mitchell was on 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 uh, on one of the news shows over the weekend Meet the press. on Meet the Press. And she's and and her quote was basically he's ignorant and uneducated about the world, about the world, Tony. Ignorant and uneducated about the world, the whole world. And she was angry. She was angry about it. She was terse. She was tense. This is not a journalist that does that. Yeah. But her frustration was clearly obvious. Oh, yeah. Well, And, and I mean, most of them are uh, frustrated and, and frightened. I mean, you watch. I, I said this. I don't know if I said this on air, but I, I know I said it to you the other day is uh, my wife and I are watching one of the new shows. It might have been Morning Joe on MSNBC in the morning or the show that follows it. And there was Michael Steele, the former RNC chairman, and a couple other guys. And Pamela, my wife, is watching this and it, they're they're looking, you know, the they're on camera and she goes, Richard, they look, they look really scared. They look really like frightened and embarrassed. And a lot of them were, were Republican uh, pollsters and stuff. And then the camera goes to Michael Steele, who's African American. And she goes, even he looks pale. Right. And, huh. and I, and I don't know how he manages to maintain some kind of composure. Uh, I don't know how, how he does it, but he still manages to kind of defend what's going on. And at some point, I mean, even he's got to be able to give up on on that because it's... Well, it's, he said this morning on Morning Joe, Michael Steele said this morning on Morning Joe, that the reality is Donald Trump will have the lion's share of delegates, whether he has the 1237 or 1232, whatever it is, that he needs is certainly an open question. But he says if he shows up at the convention with the lion's share of delegates, he believes that uh, sanity will prevail and that they will give him the nomination uh, in order to honor democracy. 
Uh, I don't necessarily know. I believe that. Uh, but that's what he said this morning. Wow. Um, anyway, yeah. like I said, we've got a lot of audio. Let me, and you know, I, I told you to spin the wheel, but I, I actually want to head in a direction. Uh, the media has been, and since we were talking about the media, has been criticized for uh, allowing Donald Trump to get away with a lot. Uh, Bill Maher uh, actually did a great job of taking apart Chuck Todd, who uh, hosts Meet the Press on Sundays and during the week on MSNBC hosts a daily version of Meet the Press. So if we could start with that, I think it's going to be a great jumping off point to the other stuff we have. Sure. Um, so, uh, okay, so let me get to this other issue that happened this week, which is about, I think, manliness, because the candidates were oh, going back at each other about their wives. <laughs> and I, I just got to say, part of this problem is the media. I turned on... Uh, what is it called now? Uh, Meet the Press Daily on MSNBC? Okay. Just show this little clip. This is how Chuck Todd opened the show today. If it's Friday, it's a week that started with a major terrorist attack and the likelihood of a big commander-in-chief test. And yet, it got turned into an unbelievable exchange of our candidate wives and the National Enquirer. How did we devolve to this? Yeah, How? <laughs> Who? Who's talking about this? I, I don't know how this happened. This, this, it is this, how? Come on. You this are, it's, it's, complete it's, lack of self-awareness on the part of the press it, that they are the problem. No, but it, you can't, it's a two-year, $10 billion election. You can't sustain interest in Americans for anything for that long unless you feed them something. Okay, but this, right? is, a news, this is a news channel. Ostensibly. Is, ostensibly. Yeah, but it's entertainment, though. I think no, no, no. This is an entertainment show. Yeah. That's a news channel. But, but, but CNN has the same, you know, obligation. That's MSNBC. To, well, whoever, there's the same obligation to advertisers' dollars. As, That's the problem. Yeah, but, yeah. Right. They say get the money out of politics. we got to get the money out of the news business. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's not going to happen. We're not going to get the money out of the news business. In fact, I go back to a comment that I made last week or the week before. The Koch brothers routinely advertise on MSNBC. Yeah, they do. I've noticed that. And I mean, and it's a did... generic Coke commercial. It's a generic Coke company commercial. It's not specific to toilet paper or diapers or soap. Right. It's Coke Industries. Yeah. And how wonderful they are, and and how they're they're changing yeah. the world. They're, they're, Absolutely, we're, cha we're we're changing we're changing the world for the better. Well, that was a great that was a great piece, and it just kind of uh, you know confirms what uh, you and I were just talking about. Uh, and the Morning Joe show dealt with this issue this morning, where Bob Woodward criticized Mika and Joe for not asking the right kind of follow up questions. They, of course, knew the question was coming and were able to pull out some recent interviews with Donald Trump where they attempted to get him to answer some questions. But as you and I both know, and we actually played the audio during the show once, during the break, where they're BSing back and forth, uh, Mika's treating him like he's some kind of god, Joe talks to him like he's his best friend. And so they can play this game all they want. The truth is, the Morning Joe show and the, a lot of the media in general allows Donald Trump to get away with almost murder. Well, and he did the same thing with um, uh, Joe, did the same thing with uh, uh, Rick Scott from Florida, right? The, the governor of Florida. And um, Well, kind of. You know, Rick Scott ended up walking out on the interview. Well, uh, no, uh, no, he didn't. Uh, Mika ended up. Yeah, he uh, did. Cut, Mika cut his mic, Tony. Uh, she, she. Well, I realized that, but Rick Scott walked away. At that but, point, he walked away instead of answering the question. They asked him, oh, and Joe begged him to answer the question, and he wouldn't do it. Right, but what what I'm what I'm getting to here is during that interview, uh, Mika uh, says, "Look, Joe, I know you and Rick are friends." And um, you have a relationship and all of that. And I'm sorry, but, 
you know, I don't I don't think that journalists should be cozy with the with the people that they're they're covering. I mean, that makes for for very uncomfortable and unfair interviews. I I always kept my distance from politicians that I was covering. I I never went out to lunch with them. I never went to play golf with them. I I kept them at a distance and I questioned them on what they were doing. Same thing with attorneys and judges and attorney generals and sheriffs and cops. I mean, when I covered that, uh, I didn't have, you know, they tried. Hey, why don't you come for a ride along? Or, hey, why don't you sit in my courtroom for a little while? Hey, how about we go get lunch and coffee? And, I mean, Tony, I, I was a brand new reporter and I knew better than than to do stuff like that. And these guys are – they're all buddies. They're all friends. They all travel in the same circles. They all have lunch together. And, you know, oh, well, you know, I'm just doing what I have to do. And if I have to be a little racist here and there, it's for the, the better good. You know, I mean, this is this is what goes on constantly. And it's it's destroying, you know, and and the fact of the matter is, is there was a time uh, before Reagan when news organizations were not. Uh, and I'm not I'm not blaming Reagan per se, but the FCC at the time uh, changed the rules about broadcasting and opinion and about newsrooms being uh, profit centers. And as soon as that that rule came into effect, that a newsroom could be a, po- a profit center is where. Networks like Fox News started popping up. No, there's no question that's true. I'll, I'll, let me make you laugh. My first job at a newspaper was as a sports reporter. Um, I thought that would make you laugh. Uh, but uh, that was my very first job. <laughs> I'm as, laughing inside. As a newspaper reporter. Okay. Um, and the very first story that I wrote was about a very, it was a college team in town and they were not good, and so I wrote a very I wrote a very fair article, but then I wrote a very uh, pointed opinion piece. Well, the coach calls me very nice uh, a couple days later. I'd only been working there a week, and said, "Hey, Tony, uh, write your stuff. Uh, you're you're obviously a good writer." And I said, "No, I have a good editor," which I did. Uh, he said, you know, I'd really like you to come by the office and we could chat a little bit, maybe grab some lunch, get to know each other, because uh, there's some stuff that was in that opinion piece that I'd, I'd really like to correct. I said, well, coach, with all due respect, it's called an opinion piece because I have an opinion. And it may be incorrect in your mind, but it was my opinion, and I'm going to stand by my opinion. Now, if you'd like to buy me lunch... I'm happy to let you do that, but what I'd really like to talk about is us as people, because I'm really not going to listen to a lecture on why I'm wrong. And he hung up the phone on me. Well, yeah, I mean, I had I had a similar uh, incident. I was a, a reporter in North Carolina, and I wrote a piece about uh, there. There was this program in the North Carolina schools called uh, the ABC, which which stood for a better chance. And if you're particular school raised its uh, its percentage of kids at or above grade level uh, by a certain percent, like I think it was 5% at the time, you got awarded uh, this exemplary status. And uh, uh, the teachers and the teaching assistants got cash bonuses for having raised that that level of at or above grade level uh, above five percent. Now you can imagine a school in, in Michigan that's called merit pay. So okay, so so let me you know uh, just if your if so if your school had let's say ten percent of the kids at or above grade level, and you improve that by five percent you got exemplary status. And if your kids, if your school had 90% of the kids at or above grade level, it was virtually impossible to raise that by another 5%. So you got nothing, but your school maintained a 90 or 96% of kids at or above grade level. So I wrote an article pointing that out and also pointing out the definition of exemplary according to Webster's. And showing that, showing that this was really unfair 
to the schools that were doing exceptionally well and had been exemplary for several years as opposed to these schools that, you know, they had, you know, maybe 15 percent of their kids at or above grade level. They raised it by 5 percent and now they were being called an exemplary school. And that article went out. And I can tell you, the school board, the teachers, um, I mean, I I almost got run out of town. And the assistant superintendent of schools, uh, Jesse Blackburn, who was awesome, uh, 70-year-old, spoke like a truck driver, swearing, cussing, great Southern accent, uh, went around with me, brought me around to every school in the county and said, listen, he's absolutely right. There is no reason you should be being called exemplary when you've had kids at or above grade level at 15 percent. I mean, it was it was huge. It was almost as bad as as the the article I wrote about NASCAR (laughs) since since I was living in North Carolina and I referred to a certain section of the fandom area outside as a shanty town. (laughs) Hey, hey, listen, I, um, you know, and again, it's a classic example of what happens when you tell the truth. Can I take a quick side trip here for two issues? Absolutely. Well, I wanted to stop and and commemorate uh, and and recognize the death of brilliant comedian Gary Shandling. Um, He passed away on Friday, and unfortunately, we weren't on the air on Friday as I was traveling to tape a television show, which uh, will air this weekend. Uh, Gary Shandling was one of my heroes. I was a huge fan of his program, uh, both of them, and uh, have been uh, blessed uh, throughout my career to have interviewed him twice. Unfortunately, um, although I have those interviews somewhere, they're on cassette or digital audio tape, uh, two formats in which I no longer have the ability to listen to. Um, That being said, I just wanted to mention his passing and how tragic it is, in my opinion. Um, I'm with you. I was was unfortunately not a big fan. Um, Not that I didn't like him. Uh, I just didn't really watch a lot of him uh, g- growing up or, or ever. I, I, I knew who he was. I know the effect and the influence that he had on comedy, and I think the guy was brilliant. Uh, I just actually never got around to watching his show. Okay. Well, I you know watched the Larry Shandling show, and I, anyway, I, I just will miss him. I, <clears throat> I also don't want to let the show go by without mentioning the act of terror in Pakistan yesterday that killed at least 72 people and injured 300, and those numbers uh, continue to climb. We talk about Brussels, uh, which we should, and many other issues. Uh, But, uh, you know, why is it uh, acceptable? Why does the media not give the same kind of coverage to what happened in Pakistan to what happened in Brussels. I, I find that very disheartening and certainly wanted to stop and, and uh, you know, again, uh, just point out the, uh, the hypocrisy of that, in my, opi- in my opinion. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we actually need to go into detail of why we think that's happening. Uh, that could be a show in and of itself. Anyway, uh, back to uh, back to our list. Uh, since we're doing, or uh, since we started with Bill Maher, let's stay with him. And we have another piece of audio uh, that certainly is fairly rich, not very long, and worth our time. That are, the ones that are most immune to Trump's appeal are the 18 to 22 to 26 year olds, the same ones that were complaining yep. about Emory. Because, and by the way, they're not on MSNBC. The average age of a watcher of MSNBC, I think it's 64, it's 67 for Fox, Fox News, News. 68. it's 62 Close for up, yeah. CNN. These guys are not paying attention to that. And they're the anti-Trump voters because they know it's a bunch of BS. But like, back to your point, though, these these news channels that have got to fill air, 
you can have somebody like Donald Trump just calling in from his pajamas in his room and they will take the call. There's no requirement for equal right. time. They're not. You go to these debates. They've got them in tiers so that the well, people because at the lower end doesn't another don't will. get equal time. I mean, how do people really how can they discern when one guy is sucking up all of the oxygen and, and, and they're allowing it to happen? You know, it used to be a lost leader, the news division. It didn't always used to be this way. CBS didn't care if they made money from Walter Cronkite. It's, That's what the Beverly Hillbilly Okay, if, if you gave Scott Walker $1.9 billion in free media, he wouldn't know what to do I with know. it. You need right. people who can actually create drama I, and excitement, I and go, sadly he, he does. Well, so what, what do you think? Well, Tony? that was really a profound, that was a profound piece of audio. And it really goes back to what uh, you said about the FCC during the Reagan years. Yeah. Um, Bill Maher was right. It was up to the Beverly Hillbillies to make CBS money, not Walter Cronkite. Well, now it's the exact opposite. They expect the news division to be profitable. And since everything in corporate America is driven by profit, why do you think CBS is selling their radio division? It's no longer profitable. Right. Um, they wouldn't have ever considered that. We're talking about a legacy radio station. We're talking about a radio station that is that history will remember for the profound nature in which it delivered news during wars and times of, of great need during this country. It's being sold because it's not profitable. Yeah. Yeah. Never, never mind that, you know, people need to hear the news and, uh, and and accurately, uh, it's it's you know Donald Trump pays the bills essentially, which is really kind of sad. Is that like they said? I mean, one point six billion. I'm sure it was a number they just pulled out of a hat, but one point six billion dollars in in free advertising. And I'm sure it's it's accurate. I mean, I'm sure it's pretty close to what what it actually is. Uh, the amount of free coverage that he gets now, CBS and NBC, um, some shows, and also um, a couple shows on Fox News have announced that they will no longer be taking calls from Donald Trump. That if he wants an interview, he's got to make uh, he's got to make an appointment like everyone else. They're not going to allow him to call in anymore. We'll see. Yeah, exactly. We'll, we'll see. You know, we'll see. Um, all right. Uh, again, we've got some uh, some great audio, but at this point, I'm going to let you uh, lead us. Where would you like to go next? Uh, well, I really liked uh, Eric Holder was on Seth Meyers the other night, and um, yes, and I I had no, and I have a couple clips from him. Eric Holder. Eric Holder is the uh, a former Attorney General of State, or I'm sorry, for the country. For those that don't know, correct. And I never had I had no idea he was so funny uh, until I saw until I saw this. So here's I've got a couple audio from this. We'll play this one first. Uh, this is basically the 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 very beginning of the interview. Is it true that you met at a dinner party in Chicago? Well, I'm now low, longer attorney general, so I can tell the truth. No, we actually met um, where we were both born in Kenya. OK. Um, <laughs> he uh, he his village came over to my village. Understood. Yeah. And it was a, a, a social gathering. Um, he and I hatched a plan. We both, he was a little younger than me, and we both said, you know what, this Kenya thing's not working out. I mm -hmm. said, I'm with you, Barack. He said, why don't we go to the United States? Gotcha. And so we migrated, tramp steamers, and we climbed over a big, big wall. I think it was in Mexico. Okay, gotcha. Uh, right. And, uh, so you can just, you just climb over them. So even right. if there was a longer wall, you, right. would, you would have made it. Well, if it's a 10-foot wall, you just get a 12-foot ladder. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for being honest, right, because right. obviously that's something you had to keep now, from the people. I was just kidding, just <laughs> kidding, just <laughs> kidding. I was born in the Bronx. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. I thought I thought it was I mean, we we already know how sarcastic Barack Obama can be. Right? And it's just it's refreshing to see, you know, like I liked uh I liked watching Lindsey Graham come out of his shell. Uh Roasting Donald Trump and Ted Cruz too, and some of his sarcastic comments. We don't we don't see enough. He's of very that from, funny. He's he, he, Lindsey Graham is a very funny man. He could have a career as a stand up comedian. Oh, he's he's hilarious. Uh, I I don't I I hate all of his policies, uh, but when when it comes to snarkiness and sarcasm, uh, he's he's pretty good. And Eric Holder, I just Did thought. You, uh, I just thought Eric Holder's Eric Holder's uh, 
response to that, uh, just the snark was was just <laughs> really, really good. Um, and like he said, yeah, I'm no Eric longer Calder in office, so I can. Say, yeah, does Eric Holder have anything to say about Donald Trump? Well, Tony, funny you should ask because I just happened to have a clip. So let's play that now. Let's do. We have uh, someone running for president right now who keeps talking about making America great again. And I think talking about this bygone era, obviously you've done a lot for civil rights. Uh, is it worrisome to you that someone's talking about this America of the past that predates all these improvements in civil rights, all these changes that's brought this country to where it is today? Yeah, I mean, you know, making America great again. America is great. America is great, has been great, and will be great. Um, and we don't want to go back to a past that, um, at least I think in Donald Trump's mind, that America really never existed, or maybe existed only for a select number of people. But if you were a person of color, if you were gay, um, the America of 40 and 50 years ago was not the most hospitable place. We want to stay where we are, build on the progress that we have made, uh, and make sure that the America of the 21st century is better than the one that was in, in the past. So give up the little stupid hats and let's work together and make a better country. All right, that sounds like a plan. And that was just perfect. I mean, it was just perfect. You know, people forget the uh, how much Eric Holder did for civil rights and how important his appointment was as attorney general to the African-American community, maybe even more important than Barack Obama being elected. Yeah, I, th I think it was. And it, it also, it you know, it sent uh, shutters through <laughs> through the GOP spine. Uh, I just think they were absolutely horrified uh, by that. And, you know, and a lot of his... Uh, a lot of the work that he did also turned turned corners in a lot of different ways. All right. Um, as uh, many people know, uh, the surrogates for Donald Trump uh, can sometimes be more bombastic than he is. And they're either fed crazy information or it's already in their head. And you have a piece of audio from CNN uh uh, with an aide for Donald Trump that uh, we have time to get in. So I was hoping that we'd be able to do that now. Yeah. And before I play this, I want to mention one thing really quickly is that um, some of the people that Trump has supposedly uh, assigned as foreign policy advisors, one of them, for example, cites being part of the model UN in 2009 and that's kind of like yeah. me saying that's kind of like me saying uh, I want to be a senator because I was on student council in high school. Uh, so <laughs> let's it let's isn't play kind of like that. It's exactly like that. <laughs> let's and let's by play. the way, I was the president of student government in college. What does that yeah, get me? A, a exactly. I, I, I was I was class president and I and I got uh, chips in the uh in the vending machine. I mean, it's really gotten, and, and he, he says this, like it's, it's perfectly, uh, le legit to, to even consider someone like that for a cabinet position. So I want to well, play this guy's LinkedIn profile. I mean, it's yeah. on his LinkedIn profile, but yeah, but anyway, go ahead and play that audio. Exactly. So this guy's on CNN and they're talking about, um, about Trump in the age of sexism. And obviously there are some more reasonable people on the, on the panel, uh, but here's uh, here's this clip. The political class in D.C., and I've seen this, I've worked here for years. The political class in D.C. works itself up into a feigned indignation over things that don't really affect the lives of anybody's real people. Anybody's feigning anything, to be quite frank. Hold on, there's nothing feigned here. Yeah. I watched your interview with Kate Baldwin, and God bless her for being on you as you as she was when you said let's agree to disagree on sexism you know what i didn't Republicans, say you okay did so you want to get in, you want to get into an argument then we'll get into an argument that's what you want you want to get into Republicans argument, can then can we will get into an argument just let him finish and then i'll let you no, talk no, you said you're not going to agree on me you interrupted me not going to agree i did not say Stephen. hold on one second no he just accused me of standing up for sexism Okay, and go that is respond. The, that, is said, absolute, that, is, that is absolutely inappropriate, I'm, I'm sir. I'm not yelling that at you. That is inappropriate. You yell at me, that's fine. I will, because you I know what? what you there said. Are let, let him finish. No. There are, you misquoted me. That is a what, lie. What did you say? I said in that interview, what I'm saying right now, mm -hmm. which is that it is a trivial issue to, debate deep, to be debating retweets when it is a fact that you have Americans dying 
every single day as a result of immigration policies. That's what I was saying. You said that we don't have real solutions to problems. I just spent the other day in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, a once great American town, a thriving hub of industry. The steel industry shut down and the town is dying. You know why the steel industry shut down? Because the political class in D.C. didn't care about product dumping, didn't care about foreign shooting. Just like Americans all over this country see their communities destroyed by uncontrolled migration. Mira. Just like cities. Oh, my God. Okay. Oh my this God. Is, this, this, you think this is this not a joke? We this is, I don't think it's a joke. joke. It's when we're talking about, you want to talk about when women's issues? About, yeah. You want to talk about women's issues? Here's, a, here's something we should be talking about. This is a fact. As a result of uncontrolled migration into this country, you can look this up. It's a statistic from Equality Now. Half a million. U.S. girls in this country are at risk of female genital mutilation. Oh, oh my that God! Is a, no, oh my come God. on! That is, that is, I, this that is exactly is, what happens. I mean, yes, with you don't John think Brown. that he says something outrageous and ridiculous. I'm not saying something outrageous. It's good. You don't think that statistic is correct? No, I don't think that statistic is correct. I don't think a half million girls. It is. It is a statistic. Let Nira. Let Nira. You don't think? Wait, you don't. That is. Can you let Nira finish? Do you mind if I look? Encourage everyone to look. Go ahead, Nira. Go ahead. The fact is that if we actually want to fight sexism in America, I agree with Doug that the wrong way to go is Donald Trump, who judges women on their looks, who says terrible things about women in every way he could possibly do. do. And the reality is that the reason why he's losing women in the general electorate, the reason why independent women, young conservative women say they will never vote for Donald Trump is because of what he does every day. Not a retweet. Just mm. the things that come out of his mouth regularly. On a, on a regular uh, basis. The, let me just very quickly before, and I'll let you take the rest of it, but very quickly, I, it goes back to that old saying, everybody has a right to their own opinion. No one has a right to their own facts. And this is just beyond revisionist history that this guy is spouting or revisionist policy that this guy is spouting. They're absolute lies. There are not a half a million young women in this country that need to be afraid of genital manipulation. Again, another Donald Trump fear tactic, and it reminds me very much of the uh, the show I taped on Friday where the piece of crap that was sitting next to me, and you'll see it as we're talking about Trump, as we're talking about national politics, as we're talking about Michigan Governor Rick Snyder and what he did to the people of Flint, he was so mired in revisionist history and uh, I kept interrupting him, which pissed him off to no end. But I'm not going to let people lie. I'll let you take it from here. We're almost out of time. So go ahead. Well, well, yeah. And, and you know, one of the panelists during that, that audio says exactly that is this is what happens. They say whatever they want to say. They don't get called on it. And somehow it becomes, you know, the next talking point. And this is where things are getting very dangerous, is that they say whatever they want to say, and nobody questions them on it, and we're left with with that. And and then people go off to, to, to do whatever they do during the day, and they go, yeah, do you know there are like half a million women who are at risk of genital mutilation in this country uh, because of immigration? Because, I mean... Really, uh, I can't remember who who was leading that panel yesterday, but that should have been his moment to step in and say, "No, you're you're completely wrong. That's inaccurate. That's a lie. That doesn't show us the statistics right now, and let's research it and find out where this is coming from." Because there's just no way that that could be true, and very few people in this country, either in journalism or in the viewing public, ever ask that question and go. Can that really be true? I mean, you'd think we'd we'd heard if if there were half a million genital mutilations going on in this country, you think we would have heard about it? You think it'd be on Facebook? <laughs> I mean, seriously. Listen, if there were a threat of a half a million genital manipulation this in this country, we would be hearing about it. The media would be covering it. Again, it's revisionist history. It's about having, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know. As I said, everybody's got a right to their own opinion, but you don't have a right to your own facts. Those are his facts. Yeah. Well, I mean, he says he's getting them from somewhere, but there there are plenty of uh, uh, quote unquote think tanks that make this stuff up on a regular basis, put it out there as legitimate, uh, skew the facts, 
And, uh, you know, that's that's what we're left with. Yeah. Well, listen, we're out of time. So if you would be so kind as to let us know how to get more information uh, about TNZ Talk, I know I'd be appreciative. Well, you can go to TNZTalk.com. That's like Trippiano and Zombeck. TNZTalk.com. You get our Facebook, Twitter. Follow us over there. Find out ways that you can support us. Our iTunes link, uh, Stitcher. Uh, we've actually applied for Spotify. Um, I'm waiting for that to come back, so we'll see what happens. Uh, but in the meantime, TNZTalk.com, our archives are up there, and all the links to get to everywhere else we are on the interwebs is up there. Tony? All right. Well, that is going to do it for us for today. We will be back tomorrow, and uh, that's uh, a, a mostly promise, 98% sure. Uh, in the meantime, you've got all the information you need. I want to thank uh, Ron Spikes and Rihanna and everybody at Blog Talk USA for everything they do to make sure we get on the air every day. Uh, and, of course, our thanks to you. Have a great day. And as always, we ask that you be well. Oh yeah, can you feel it? Just over the credits, just riffing now. Words and chords. Not the poetry and the real thing, but not bad for an ad lib. Not good, but... And it's not long enough, so just do a little bit more. And that's... Nearly done, that's the final credit there, that's the end. <clears throat>